You're listening to episode 605 of the Father Bills Podcast. Welcome back. This week's episode is entitled, The Eucharist Makes the Church, given on the Solemnity of the Body and Blood of Christ, 2017. Today we remember and celebrate an important gift that Christ has given us, himself, and this church. As Catholics, the Eucharist is the source and the summit. It is the reason we come. It is the very gift of his very body and blood, soul and divinity. And he literally nourishes us with these gifts from heaven. In the first reading, we hear about how God the Father supplied the Israelites with manna to show them that they could not survive alone without God feeding them. In the second reading, we heard from St. Paul that by receiving the cup and bread, we are not only being fed by God, but those very elements and food are God, Jesus' flesh and blood. Clearly, God wants, us to be, wants to feed us and bring us to him. And he does it in many ways. But most particularly and specifically today, we focus on the Eucharist. The Eucharist makes us who we are. We are a Eucharistic people. We are his church, a communion of faithful striving to live as Christ. It has been described by theologians that the Eucharist makes the church. It's a phrase you hear in theology circles. The Eucharist makes the church. And it makes sense when it is the Eucharist, Jesus himself, the bridegroom, who calls us, his bride, together. In communion. You know, we have communion every time we have Mass. And that communion, the Eucharist, makes us in communion. We're not just in common. We're not just singing songs together. We're being mystically drawn into the very presence of Jesus and becoming like him. Well, hopefully, if we're open to the grace. And there's the challenge. Today, in this Mass, We mark in our church the last time we will offer these gifts in this space until we meet again with a new church. We will be entering into a similar journey as the Israelites did. The journey will be difficult, and we will be tempted to bicker, and we will be tempted to complain, but please don't, because I don't don't want this to take 40 years. What has happened is a miracle. Who raises $2.367 million in two and a half months or so? Who does that? Apparently we did with the grace of God and for his glory, not for ours. This is not a work ultimately of ours. It is a work of God's. We're in the mode of receiving him like we do the Eucharist and then living that out by his service, whether it be music or lectures, and in this case, people giving specifically of their, their treasure, because we can't build a church with Legos, right? But not everything is going to work, and we will be tempted to complain. Not everything that we have planned out will happen as we planned out. There will be more efficient ways to do things, and they think that where we go, In the hall, the environment will be pretty unusual. It's not what we're used to. Remember this. When you go, it's a hall, people. It's not a church. And it'll always remain the hall. I can't tell you how many drawings. We went through 20 drawings to get to this place. 20. And actually, one of them included retrofitting the hall. We actually thought about, forget about this, make it a gym or a green space, a soccer field, you know, who knows what, and making the hall our church. Well, I can tell you that obviously got vetoed and we went on. 
But we had all kinds of ideas. But remember this. We are Eucharistic people. The, the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. So I guess it begs the question, are you a thankful people? Am I a thankful person? What's about to happen is going to be disturbing. This is not going to be a space for a while where we will want to worship. In two weeks, there'll be guys with bunny suits on and plastic and all kinds of stuff doing asbestos abatement. You don't want to be in here when that happens. Next Tuesday, when I want to invite you to consider this, come on over. Next Tuesday, this couple days, two more days from now, everybody's invited from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. to help us unbolt all the pews and put them outside. We're going to dismantle the altar, the ambo. We're going to take down our crucifix, the tabernacle. We have to get everything out of here so that they can come in and start the asbestos abatement. That'll take about two weeks. After those two weeks, we'll have Copeland uh, Construction come in and then demolish the church itself. Now, I've said this before. You might remember. How many days will that take? Three days. It's rather scriptural, don't you think? <laughs> but the rising of this church will take more than three days. It'll take 14 months from the time we demolish it to the time we probably come back maybe in September 2018. That's our schedule. It can vary, of course. But no matter what, no matter where we go, God is with us. And how can we know that? How do we know? See, as Catholics, we know because the Eucharist will be there. When we end this Mass, we'll have a procession. We're going to exit out the church. I want you to follow the procession. And we're going to go to the hall for adoration. Not a long time, but a short time. Of adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. The Eucharist is Christ. We follow him wherever he goes. And he's going to the hall. So if you stick around here, you're going to be by yourself. Don't be by yourself. Let's follow Jesus. He is and will be our food for our journey. And with such spiritual nourishment, we will be able to receive all kinds of blessings that God wants to give us. But we have to be open to it. And bitterness, bickering, and complaining shuts us off from his grace. So we'll gather in a more intimate place. We will be elbow to elbow. And that'll be different because we have some spaces between us, I see. When you go over to the hall, you'll be asked when you come into the hall for Mass, please take a seat in the center of the area of the, the chairs. By the way, the chairs are very comfortable. So comfortable you might want to take a nap, but please don't. They're going to be more comfortable than this. These pews, by the way, I was just talking to a parishioner uh, who owns Rogue Valley Door, and he was asking me yesterday, he goes, well, how about if we look at these pews? What are you going to do with them? I said, well, we're going to give them away to anybody who wants them on Tuesday. Come on by. They're too long. We'll cut them down. We've got a chainsaw ready for it. He said, you know, what do you think if I took a few and see if we could make them into our new doors? I'm like, oh, there's an idea. I didn't know you could do that. That's honoring our past and building our future. Let's see if that can happen, right? I don't know how that's going to happen. I've never done that. I don't know how to... I'm a priest. I'm not a lumber person. I don't know <laughs> construction at all. But I want you to know that's what we're going to do. We'll see what happens on Monday. That'll be t they'll take some out of the pews out of here to see if they can do that. Meanwhile, we're going to empty that church out of all the pews on Tuesday. And we're going to do it carefully, too, because I, just, I got an email just this last week. Or no, actually, yesterday from a good parishioner who had a concern, a good one. And she actually went through some of the pews, and she found, uh, to her dismay and mine, that some people who have come, when not receiving the host, put it underneath the pew like it was gum. Now, this should disturb us, because this, please, if you're not receiving the host, don't receive it, okay? Um, but, and especially if you accidentally received it, please give it back to us, okay? Uh, I've had all kinds of situations. I've had people that put it in their mouth, take it out, put it in the book, and then days, weeks later, someone comes to me like, Father Bill, there's this music book. What, there's some pages bonded together. What is that? It was clearly a host that someone had, you know, tried to eat and put it in the, I mean, in the book. I'm like, this is, this is bad, there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. That, my friends, is bad. Please, that's what we need to be people of. That is also making sure the Eucharist is tended well. This is Jesus' body. And it seems crazy that it would happen, right? But it has happened. And it could happen in the future. But I don't want to get down that rabbit hole, honestly. I really want to focus on the fact that when we leave here, we leave not alone. We leave to a hall with Jesus with us. We are a Eucharistic people. Wherever Jesus goes, we go. The, ch 
the Eucharist makes the church. If the Eucharist is going to be in the hall, the hall is not the church. We are the church. We come together. So in order to build this church, we have to do many things. And I just mentioned some of them. Some have already occurred. The people on the east side of the church here can probably recognize there's something missing on the west side. People on the west side, you probably didn't notice. When I was young, they said, don't ever look behind you in church. It's rude. But I want to ask you, go ahead, look behind you. Notice what's up in the balcony. Or I should say, what's not in the balcony? Our pipe organ was dismantled this last week. It took uh, four days. And it is now at St. John the Baptist Episcopal Church in Portland. Praise God that it's in a church where the praises of God can be sung. That happened. Uh, there's more to be happening. So I want you to know that Mr. Noveski, who put all that together, did a fantastic job. And don't take my word for this. The people that were taking the church organ down were amazed that, a, that an amateur, you could say, not a professional, put that together because it was so well done. It was done professionally. In the bulletin this week, I want to uh, recognize Mr. Noveski and his family for all that he did for us. So there's an there's a insert in our bulletin. That insert came from a photocopy of something I found in the Oregon. There was an 8.5 by 11 uh, copy of some like newspaper article back in the day when it was being put together. I thought, well, let's not, we want to keep this. Let's honor him. Let's rejoice in the good things that he's done. And so that's in the bulletin that you may have picked up when you got in, but make sure you get one before you leave. So please consider what you can do. Tuesday, come on down. Uh, if you can't lift up a one-ton pew, I mean, that's 30 feet of pew. That's pretty heavy. Maybe you can help us pick up the, the booklets, right? In fact, at the end of this Mass, I might ask you to make all the, pick up everything in the pews and put them at the ends of the pews so we can pick them up on, easily on Tuesday. Get up early. Come on down at 7 a.m. So also know this. If you want to come to Mass on Saturday, you need to know the new time. Do you know what the new time is for the English Mass? It is 5 o'clock. Not 5.30. It is 5 o'clock. What time is it? 5 o'clock. Now, that means, what about confessions? Well, confessions are going to move a half hour early as well. They were at 4. They're now going to be at 3.30. That's right. And this is going to be the same over in the hall. So next week, come to Mass, all at the hall. If you want to come to confession, go to the hall by 3.30. It'll be open. We'll be having confessions in room 1 and room 2. Those are the biggest confessionals we've ever had. <laughs> They're classrooms. That's right. And there will be the opportunity to go face-to-face -face or behind a screen, et cetera. So those will always still be there. And at this point, as far as I can tell, those time frames will be in perpetuity until we have some better idea. So when we come back to this church in this magnificence to praise God, confessionals will be and the masses will be as they will be starting next week. So lastly, I want to tell you uh, before we conclude the homily about more about this, we need to also uh, continue with our our part, which is the financial part, right? We have made pledges, but we need to continually turn in all those pledges. So every quarter we're giving out a letter. We kind of messed up on the first quarter. So uh, the first quarter you didn't get a letter, but everybody who's pledged, uh, we've crafted the letters. They're going to go out. I've gotten mine. You should see it in the next couple of days. Just letting you know where you are in regard to your pledge. To let you know if you're behind or on track or even ahead. And if you're behind, I'd ask that you really consider catching up and if you're on track, good for you. That's awesome. I might encourage you to think about how about getting ahead. And those of you who are ahead, this is what this does for us. We recognize that eventually we'll have to take a loan out for this building project. While we have a million plus in the bank, uh, come January or so, we'll need to take a bridge loan from the archdiocese. And uh, the less that we have to loan, the better, right? Because we have to pay interest on that loan. So whenever everybody, when anybody pays ahead, that's less interest that we have to pay. And actually, more that goes to our reserve fund as well. So we build the building, and we then keep more for ourselves instead of paying the, the interest on it. I can tell you that some of our biggest givers have actually paid off their entire pledge of hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's pretty impressive. It's awe-inspiring. So just to let you know that's happening. So all of this happening is difficult. It is disturbing. It's sad. And that is real. I don't want us to Pollyannish walk out of here, this church, but actually walk out in solemnity, in joy, but also with a little bit of sadness. We're used to things, right? And, and those things 
are good, and some are probably attachments we need to let go of. It's an important thing for us to suffer, die, so that we may rise again. It's the, it's the paradigm of life of all Christians. It's called the Paschal Mystery. Jesus suffered, he died, so he could rise again. We need to then recognize where we suffer. Maybe verbalize it. Maybe talk to somebody. Uh, you can come to me. I'm happy to listen. And then walk through that and let go. And when we finally let go, believe me, there will be joy. Because as long as we allow ourselves to be attached to things, those things get in the way of what God wants to do in our lives. So faith is what we need. And when we're weak, Jesus will be strong. When we are lost, he will help us find our way. And when we receive the Eucharist, we know that we can be fed and be strengthened in all of these things. Remember, it is our souls that are most important. And he will feed our souls if we just be open to it. And so after we are with each other in the hall for many, many weeks, getting to know each other like we've never gotten to know each other before, we will still see Jesus. In fact, I would like to predict that we'll be more focused. All the beauty of a church is good, but it can also distract. There's not much beauty going on in the hall. That forces us to focus why we're there. We're there for Jesus. Remember, it's not a building, just a building that makes church. Mostly, it's the Eucharist that brings us together and makes us church. So we can be here. We can be there. On Christmas Easter, we'll be over at the school gym. We can be almost anywhere, as long as Jesus is there. Be prepared then. Jesus has something in store for each one of us, and I don't want you to miss it. This time may be the only time you have for this challenge, to be open to working through the difficult stuff, the attachments we have, and letting go and letting Jesus in, in the Eucharist, so that he can then prepare us to be the saints he wants us to be. May we then be Eucharistic people, thankful for all his blessings. May we enter into this new time with open hearts, open minds, thankful hearts, and thankful minds, and a willingness to be flexible. Remember, it is Jesus, it is the Eucharist that makes the church. We are his, and he is ours. Amen. Thank you again for listening to this episode of the Father Bales Podcast. Well, it was quite an emotional weekend for me and for all of our parishioners, and I would ask that you would pray for us as we have now concluded all our services all our sacraments in our current church, which will now be set due for demolition in some time now. And so as we do so, you heard in the homily, we'll be in our hall offering Mass in a very cozy space. But I'd like to just close with a prayer, which is uh, the campaign prayer we had from the beginning. And I'd ask that you would, as you listen to it, pray for us as well, and that we will continue to be able to fund it as we need to, and also do what it is that we're called to do to build a church that is worthy of the Lord and that is uh, something that will inspire many generations to come. And so we pray. Lord, divine architect, creator of our human family, risen Jesus, cornerstone of our faith, lover of us all, spirit of wisdom, builder of community, our inspiration and guide, you call us to build up your kingdom. Bless us with generous hearts, open minds, greater unity, renewed vision, as we seek to build a house for worship and celebration. May it be a home where all are welcomed, nourished, and empowered to be Christ for others. Amen. If you have any comments or questions, of course, always feel uh, free to go to my website, fatherbill.org, where you can find my um, social media connections, as well as a portal to email me directly. And until next time, may God bless you and have a great week. Bye-bye.